OK, so. Um, I'll go through each of these problems here. Let's start with. I have some additional uh, worksheets too here if uh, you didn't pick one up yesterday. Okay, so uh, the limit as X approaches negative eight. If I have the graph in front of me, if I'm trying to find what the limit is, I'm always going to have to start on both ends and see if my arrows are headed towards the same place. So uh, negative eight is along this asymptote. I pick points on either side of negative eight. Because limit has to involve um, the behavior from both sides and they're both headed towards negative infinity. So there is a consistency there, but it's not a real number. So technically the limit doesn't exist. But. Because they're both going to negative infinity, they're both headed in the same direction. We have a subcategory. Under does not exist. We can say. Give it uh, a quick description as to how the graph is behaving. They're both headed in the same direction. They're so both. Say in the parentheses. Yeah, parentheses. Yeah. I mean, you could also say negative infinity, but just to understand that is a subcategory of the of DNA. That is not a real. Limit. That's not a uh, that's not a true limit. The limit technically doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, any order pair. You don't care about what's happening around the point, right? Limit you do limit. You you're talking about the approach. Order pair. You're just zeroing in on that X value and you're seeing if anything is there. So here I don't see any order pair living on this vertical line negative eight. So here undefined. Okay, undefined and doesn't exist or interchangeable. You can say DNE, you can say undefined. Okay, limit as x approaches negative five. Again, when I see a limit, uh, asking for a limit, I have to involve two starting locations and seeing where they're headed. So I'm picking points on either side of negative five. I'm going to head towards negative five. And the arrows are obviously moving towards a different uh, destination, right? They're not consistently moving towards the same y value. So here, it's not exist. Would you not go to that solid point? Not if we're following the path of the graph, right? The path of the graph is not leading us towards this point. Right? So I always tell students, Start on both sides of your target and, and draw your arrow along the path of the graph. The arrows are headed in the same direction towards the same Y value. Even if it never reaches it, that's where the limit is. If it doesn't, then the limit doesn't exist. G of negative five. Now we care about what's happening at negative five. We ignore all the holes. We're just going to pinpoint the Y value. The Y value is four. Okay. Limit as X approaches two. So pick points on either side of two. Both sides of two. And then head towards two. See where the graph is leading you. And in this case, both those arrows are pointing to the same destination. They're both pointing to a Y value of six. The limit does exist at six. G of two, we don't care where the path is leading. We just want to know where the point is defined. There's a hole there. We ignore it, but there is a point to find here, and that point is a y value of three. G of seven, is there a point to find at seven? Yes, there is, because the graph goes right through the order pair of seven, two. 
So y value of two. Limit as x approaches seven. So pick points on either side of seven. Head towards seven. And the arrows are moving towards the same location. They're both headed towards a y value of two. Any questions? number two uh, sketch a graph now uh, on the quiz I'm going to say sketch a function okay. so the key thing here is we want to make sure that whatever we create that 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 uh, your graph will pass the vertical line test okay okay so if a limit exists that means the graph has to approach the same y value from both sides so Whenever I see a limit exist, I always pinpoint that order pair, but I always put a hole on that order pair, and I'm always extending from extending in both directions slightly. Okay, I don't want to go too far because I don't want to accidentally um, conflict with another part of the graph because I don't want a graph that's right below another graph because I need to pass a vertical line test. So at that order pair, I just like to um plot a hole and the reason that i want to plot a hole there is because that point later on could be defined elsewhere and i don't want to conflict with that so just put a hole there extend from extend uh in both directions and uh you're, you'll you'll be safe uh and, and it won't uh you won't step on um uh, another what another uh, part of the function is doing but you want to make sure that you do it this way and not this way okay i see some students do this where uh, they extend and they put arrows. Okay, it seems harmless with those arrows, but if I see arrows, I'm going to follow that arrow. If I follow that arrow, eventually it's going to conflict with another part of the graph. So don't ever do this. Okay. You can start with this, and later on, if you want to extend to another part of the graph to connect, you can do that. All right, so let's find order pair negative five, negative four. Just extending in both directions. I'll leave it alone for now and I'll come back to it if I need to, if I want to uh, clean that up. But that's that fulfills what uh, uh, part A is asking you to do. Okay, part B. Oh, uh, actually, I should have done this. Uh, I've been telling um, our students to go ahead and do the easy stuff first, right? So plot all the order pairs. Let's get that out of the way. So part C, negative two, negative eight. Two seven. And those all have to be solid dots. Right? That's right. That's right. All the order pairs are solid dots. Five one. Five two. OK, uh, it's going to go down the line here. Um, G of negative five is undefined, so I'm looking up here all along negative five. It's already undefined. That hole is there, so looks like my condition has been reached. Yes. Isn't B telling you that A is a hole? Like, if B wasn't there, A could have just been like a point along the line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, say it again. Isn't B telling you that like like A or X of negative five is a hole because if it didn't say that G of negative five is undefined, it could have just been a point. It could have been a point. That's right. That's right. Um, but that's why uh, if I whenever I see a limit, I always put a hole there because um, because that's the safer way to go. Right. That way, 
at worst, you'll have to fill in that hole, but you never have to turn around and erase anything, right? So you can always just add to it if you need to, but you never have to remove anything because you have the bare bones there. Yeah, but you're right. If it says t of negative five equals negative four, then I will go in and I would fill in that hole, fill in that, that hole, yeah. Okay, limit x approach is two equals infinity. So I know that this is telling me that I have a vertical asymptote. And if it's infinity, I need both branches to uh, behave in the same way. I need both branches to go up, so I need the graph to look like this. Make sure when you when you do your branches, uh, uh, your graph headed towards the vertical asymptote that your arrows are getting closer together. Right? We don't want to do this. I see some students doing this where um, they have the asymptote. You have the arrows pointing up like that. Okay, so that's not the case. You want the arrows to get closer, not further apart. Okay, so a negative two. My graph is headed towards positive infinity. Uh, some students have asked, wait a second, so there's a vertical asymptote here, so why is there a point on that asymptote? The reason why we can do this is because this is a piecewise function. You have different functions that are layered on top of the same graph, right? There's a function, there, there is no function that will ever do this where uh, there's an asymptote and then there's a point that lives there, right? This, so this is one function. And there's another function that's defining this point, but we can still call this overall uh, graph a function because technically the vertical line test has not been um, uh, and has not failed, right? Every point still passed the vertical line test, so that's why we have you can have these strange things happen because you're putting different the functions and layering it onto the same graph. OK, part F, limit as x approaches 2 does not exist. So whenever you have a limit that doesn't exist, you have a lot of options at, at in front of you. You can do a couple things. So if a limit doesn't exist, you can either have a graph purposely be disconnected, Right, that's that's an example of it doesn't exist. You could also have a graph that shows a vertical asymptote where the branches are headed in either direction or the same or different. Or you could just have a graph where there's only a graph on one side and nothing on the other. Right? An endpoint would also uh, be an example of where limit doesn't exist. So you have options in front of you. Everyone's interpretation is going to be different. So it's very possible everyone has a different thing showing uh, for the limit doesn't exist. So you have a choice. So I'm just going to choose to have two disconnected graph here. But you could do anything you want. Or any of these options. Next up, limit as x approaches 5 is equal to negative 3. So I want to plot a hole at 5, negative 3, and I want to extend, make sure the graph extends from uh, to both sides. So 5, negative 3, I find 5, I go down negative 3. Just going to put a hole there and extend slightly. Limit also exists, 7, negative 3. Now, I try to put a hole at 7, negative 3, but what do you see here? Why is there not a hole here? Yeah. 
because G of seven is filling in that hole. So the graph is just going to be connected right through that point. So you could have the graph like this, or um, you can kind of just clean this up a little bit if you like, just uh, making sure that you're not having any conflict with any parts of the graph. I'm just tying up some loose ends. Looks a little bit cleaner this way, but you know, if you have all, if you have disconnected graph, that's fine. As long as every part of your graph has the vertical line test, right? If I drop any vertical line, I'm never hitting more than one point. Okay, let's go to the back. Wait, why did you go to? You, you didn't have to. You, you could have left everything separate. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, this one here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, wait. This one here, right? Okay. Yeah, I'll go through each of them, but um, yeah, I can start with number six. So remember, um, the first thing that we do, regardless of what you think is going to happen uh, with your express with your limit problem, you're always going to insert the x value. Okay. Don't jump into trying to factor, reduce anything until you've confirmed that there's a hole and you need to keep going. So first thing we do is we plug in the one. Direct substitution. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Nickel. Yeah. So four minus one is three, three minus two is one. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 1 half is a real number, so that's our limit. Nothing more needs to be done. Even though it looks like, oh, I need to factor and reduce, but there's nothing that tells me that I need to do that, right? I'll, I only have to go to that step if I see a 0 over 0. But if I see a real number, then that's my answer. There's nothing more to be done. Yes? Do it show us plenty of time, or can we do it? Yes, you can do it in your head. But I still five, need zero. to see that. Yeah, if it's zero over zero, I want to at least see an indication that you that you're showing me that you're testing it out. Right. Okay. Right, let's uh, let's go to number three here. I'm gonna go through each most of these problems here. Okay, first things first, um, evaluate the expression, see what we're dealing with. So plug zero in for x, zero plus six is six, one six minus one six to zero, zero at the denominator is zero, so zero over zero. Okay, we know there's a hole, we know there's something that is uh, hindering our ability to see a real number, but we do know that there is a limit at the end of the answer, at the end of this process, right? We just haven't reached it yet. So uh, our goal is to find something that pairs up between numerator and denominator to cancel out, right? And the hint is in the denominator, right? You see that denominator is just an X, that X is causing a zero. So we know that there must be an X hiding in the numerator that we need to cancel out. We haven't found it yet, but it's there. We can't rely on this X, right? This X is attached to the plus six. It's not in the same location. We can't cancel that out. So we know that we have to kind of play with this expression to get it to show us that hole that we want to clearly remove. So we know what we can do with this is we can merge two fractions, but only after we find a common denominator and balancing the fraction. So I'm going to step to the side here and uh, just work on these two fractions here.
So anytime I want to add or subtract fractions, I have to make sure that my denominators are the same. I need to find common denominator. So the X plus six and X are completely separate denominators. So if I want to find a common denominator, I need both of them um, to create my common denominator. So I need a six and an X plus six. I like to leave it in factor form. It's just easier to see all the parts. I typically don't like to expand. It kind of lose your ability to see things clearly when when, when things are, are expanded. Okay. So now that we have our common denominator, we need to balance the numerators within these fractions. So we ask ourselves, um, what has been added from this old denominator to this new denominator? What's changed? Six. So because I added a six to get from here to here, I also need to include a six in the numerator. And by adding, I mean you know, like multiplying. So we multiply one times six is six. So we have our numerator balance for the first fraction. So we leave that alone and we go to the second fraction. Between this denominator and this denominator, what has been added has been the x plus six. So that is tell so that is indicating to us what we need to do to the numerator to to uh, keep that balance of our fraction. OK, so now that I have common denominators, I can merge the numerators together. I can merge these two into one fraction. So I'm going to distribute the negative through so I can just drop the parentheses. Combine like terms, six and six goes away. So now we have an updated, cleaner version of the numerator we started with. Okay, so I'm just going to take what I've, uh, the progress I've made, and replace it in for what I started with. And let's see. If that helps us move to our next step. Okay. We still have a complex fraction, but I do think that that we are beginning to see our whole kind of take shape, right? We can see the numerator provide us the X that we're looking for. But it's still a complex fraction, um, so to convince ourselves that, that these are the ones that we want to pair up and, and reduce, let's see if we can collapse this fraction into something a little bit cleaner. So uh, we can always move a denominator term to the numerator or vice versa if I Keep change to the right if I multiply by the reciprocal. So I can move this x up to the top, multiply by the reciprocal, which is 1 over x. That allows me to kind of move that x out of the way. And now that everything is at the same level, if you want, you can just put it all under one fraction and Hopefully, the hole is easy to spot now, right? Now, if you look at between numerator and denominator, you can clearly see there's an x above, there's an x below. There's neither terms are being added or subtracted to another term, so they are uh, free to uh, cancel and remove. So now that we've removed the hole, which was causing that zero or zero, we should be able to re evaluate and get down to a real number because right? we know that there's a real number waiting for us. We've removed the obstacle and we should be able to get to our limit. Now, what's left up top? A negative one, right? Negative one. And even if that negative wasn't there, right? If everything cancels out, you want to make sure you put a one there, right? Not a zero. You still have a one left over. Reevaluate zero in for X. Zero plus six is six. Six times six is thirty six. Yeah, 
Let me do a sorry. Let me let, let me do a conjugate one so okay. that because uh, we already did the complex we already did a complex fraction. Uh, let me do number five first. Okay. Sorry, real quick. Number four. Okay. Number four. I just want to have you guys see all the different variations here. If I start off by evaluating my expression. Uh, inserting the X, I get two times one squared plus two times one minus three all over one minus one. Okay, so two plus two is four, four minus three is one. We get one over zero. Okay, how do we interpret one over zero? Because there's a what? Vertical Good, there's a vertical asymptote. We may not know exactly how the graph is behaving around it. It could be the arrows head in the same direction. It could be different directions, but Ultimately, we know the big picture. We know there's a vertical asymptote. We don't know the full details of how, uh, of how the graph is, looks at, around that, but it's enough for us to know that the limit doesn't exist. Okay, and we can stop there, right? Okay, so here's number five. Okay, so first things first, evaluate the expression, see what, we're see what we're dealing with. Insert five in for X, five uh, plus 11 is 16. 16 square roots is four. So four minus four is zero, zero over zero, good. And so we know there's a hole. We have to find a way to find uh, that matching pair between numerator and denominator and cancel out and reevaluate. So the big hint is the denominator, right? X minus five, basically we want the numerator to show us an X minus five so that we can cancel out. X minus five is the only thing in the denominator, so we know that has to cancel out, and that is informing us what is what we expect and want to see in a numerator. But right now, the numerator is not giving us something that is easy to spot, right? It's stuck in this radical form. So what if we can find a way to get rid of the radical? Then hopefully that numerator will show us something uh, that is easier to pair up with. So the strategy here, here is um, we want to multiply by the conjugate. The, the conjugate method has a way of removing and undoing this radical and placing it elsewhere. So. Conjugate term is always the exact same expression as you see with one slight change. What do we change? We change the operation that's between the two terms. In this case, it's that minus sign. You want to change that minus to a positive. So we want to foil out the numerator in the hopes that the radical will go away and hopefully show us something that is uh, more similar to this x minus 5. Okay, so I'm going to foil out the numerator. So take the first term and distribute it through the parentheses. So 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times square roots. So we're done with the first term distributing. So now let's work on the second term distributing through the parentheses. Negative square root times four. Minus square root times square root. What's going to happen with square root times square root? So the cancel out is going to go away, but we're left with that 11 plus x. Negative times positive is negative. But something that a lot of students miss is what? Parentheses. Parentheses. Now that the radical is gone, the negative is going to find its way to distribute through. So as a reminder, 
either you do it now or you do it later. So I'm going to do it later, but I'm going to remind myself with the set of parentheses. Denominator, don't FOIL out the denominator because you already have something that you're going to cancel out from the denominator. If you FOIL it out, you're going to lose that X minus five. So leave your denominator alone. It's in the perfect place for you to pair up and cancel out. OK, more cleanup is needed from the numerator, so. Um, I can cancel out the middle terms, right? The square root. One is positive and the other is negative. I'll go ahead and. Clean up the numerator a bit more. I'll distribute the negative through. Find my terms. So things are getting closer. Five minus X, next minus five. We know that they are related. They're not quite per matching up perfectly yet, but we see that they're both of these terms are just off by a negative one. So if I can factor a negative one. From one of them, let me just do it from the top. If I change the sign, factor of negative one, the negative of five becomes negative five, the negative x becomes x. X minus five and negative five plus x. Now, these look, um, they're different in different order, but they're the same, right? The X's are positive, fives are negative. Remove, the whole has been removed. We know that we can reevaluate and we should be able to get down to a real number. So replace five in for the re any remaining X's. Root 11 plus 5, or 11 plus 5 is 16, root 16 is 4. Questions here? Uh, number 10 was the request. First things first, replace two and for all the X's. Two over two is one, one minus one is zero, two minus two is zero. Okay, we know there's a hole, but we know that it's going to have to be the numerator that we try to clean up. So let's see if we can get a common denominator to show up. My common denominator between X and one is just going to be X. Balance the fractions here. No balance is needed because my denominator didn't change. Here from one to X was changed as the X, so I need to multiply the numerator by X. Merge it into the same, into the same fraction. No like terms in the numerator, so the best we can do is to leave it as 2 minus x over x. So I'll take my old expression and replace it with my updated one. So I still have a complex fraction, but at least I be, I'm beginning to see some parts that are paired up that could be paired up nicely. 
So I know that I'm targeting these two in hopes that these two will cancel out. Right? But I'm just going to go ahead and move this x minus 2 to the top. Um, I can collapse the fraction. I can move the denominator if I involve the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of x minus 2 is 1 over x minus 2. So I've moved the x minus 2. I'll get that out of the way. Yes. Um, so whenever we're doing that, I had trouble with it last night because I thought x minus 2 and 2 minus x were like completely different because the x is negative. Right. But it could be the same thing. It can be the same thing if you just factor a negative one from one of them. Right. If you just pull a negative one out, then all of a sudden you can change the signs of both those terms and they will match up nicely. Yeah. So it, so you're right. It's not quite perfect yet, but we can still do something to and get, I don't have to like factor the negative out of that, right? To make it well, so so this is what I'm gonna do here. Two minus x, x minus two. I can't cancel out, but what if I just factor a negative one from the numerator, then I get negative one. So if I factor negative one, that means the two will change to a negative two, and a negative x will become a positive x. Now, even though these look different, these are the same because the twos are negative, the x are positive. Whole has now been removed. Reevaluate the limits. I get negative one half. That's so a real you, number. You have to have the same third. Without it. That's right. You have to have matching pairs. If you ever see zero over zero, you know there's a matching pair waiting for you to remove. Okay, I'll walk around, see if you guys have any any, any individual questions. 